Okay, so my name is David Kronapo, um, and I will be trying to explain a bit about using databases for scientists with my colleague Simon. Um, so first, to talk a bit about myself, uh, ourselves. Um, so I've been involved in the Python Scientific Committee for quite a while. Some people may know me through, I've been like the risk manager for NumPy for a while. I've been doing a lot of like C code, uh, refactoring NumPy, SciPy. I've been starting what became scikit-learn, started to be popular when I stopped working on it. I try not to be uh, angry about it, but. Uh, um, and um, yeah, I've been working at Ensort for three years now. Um, so Ensort is a company doing scientific consulting for Python. And um, we've been working with Simon on some project in finance industry and some other things. Okay, um, Simon, maybe you want to say a few words about yourself before we start? So, um, I'm Simon Jago, I've been working for Enthought for about three years as well, uh, working on developing scientific applications, more on the application development side rather than uh, the science uh, side. Um, and been working with Python for that sort of thing for about six years. Okay, so, so this talk that we'll be doing uh, today is actually a kind of extended version of something I did two years ago at the first PyData. So the idea is, so I myself more like a scientist. You know, I did my PhD in uh, speech recognition in Japan. And so I don't know exactly what the audience here is, but as a scientist, database for me, it was this horrible thing to do um, business report and <laughs> things that you really don't want to hear about when you're academic, right? And um, after my PhD, I started uh, to work for a small uh, company in Japan doing like recommendation. And of course, you have to deal with databases because that's what people use. And I realized that database is actually quite interesting, even for the scientists, and it's not just for business reports. And there's a bit of this divide between people using databases and people using like NumPy, Pandas, all these kind of great tools. And it's not always obvious uh, which one to use. As a scientist, it's not obvious why you would use databases. So what you're trying to convey here a bit is, like it's not really like NumPy versus databases, but it's much more about how we can try to, in which case it doesn't make sense to use databases, in which case it makes sense to use NumPy, how we can use NumPy, Pandas, etc., from databases, because sometimes you have to use databases just because the data is in a database and your manager is asking you to get some data from this Microsoft SQL Server data, and but you don't want to touch database, you just want to use Pandas. So we'll talk a bit about that. Sometimes some people who are not scientists, who are not like, don't really know about data science, they know about SQL. So sometimes you want to do the opposite, right? You have some Pandas data frames. And like, okay, Pandas is great, but if you don't really know much about Pandas or Python and your word is SQL, is there a way to create data frames in SQL? So we'll talk a bit about all of this, um, not really in detail because you only have one hour, but hopefully we will manage to give you a bit of an idea of what's available out there and the different tools you can use with a bend on like the Python philosophy of you know, how to use simple tools that works well and can be extended to do like non-trivial things. So if I do that, does it work? Yeah. So really the, the first thing is why using databases at all? Because again, that's the example of a scientist. So, okay. Scientists, you have, you know about NumPy, et cetera and you really like to do uh, data analysis with NumPy and Pandas because that's what you're familiar with. And basic arrays is what you know. There's all these things about data types, it's all floats and like maybe integers, but like basic numerical data types. So to justify a bit why you should care at all about database, um, we have here one of the simple but not completely artificial example of some data analysis on Stack Overflow. So I think pretty much everybody is familiar with Stack Overflow, right? Yeah. So Stack Overflow is this website that happens a lot when you look for a programming problem in Google. Uh, so one cool thing about Stack Overflow is that they make the data available for you. Um, you can download on BitTorrent. You actually did use that. Um, you have a 20 gigabyte of compressed data of all the Stack Exchange uh, data where you have like the posts, the questions, the comments, 
almost all the information that is in the databases of Stack Overflow website, you, ha you have it available for yourself. So you can do some data analysis on that. And so since the data is publicly available, maybe you want to look a bit at maybe what are the popular tags. Okay, popular tags, that's not so useful, not so interesting because you get that already on the Stack Overflow website. But maybe you want to look at the trends of the tags over time. And so, again, your scientists, I mean, myself a few years ago, what I would have done is create some XML file, that's the format of uh, Stack Overflow. I have NumPy arrays, and uh, I will do that. Problem is, that's a 23 gigabyte XML file. And you have like around 18 million questions on the main Stack Overflow website. So, the well known uh, technique of brute force will not work exactly uh, as well as you would like on the laptop, at least. And this was a few years ago as well. So, yeah, it's too large to use pandas on a laptop. And the other interesting part is you don't have just one large XML file. You have like a few large XML files. So you have things like you have posts and you have tags, but maybe you have like some independent information on another XML file and they are linked together through a relation that's coming from a SQL database. And it's not clear how you would do that in NumPy when you don't have enough RAM to do just everything brute force. So the idea here is maybe we can store the data in a database because right, one big advantage of database is it gives you the idea of out of core computation where even on a laptop, having 200 gigs of data, assuming you have enough hard space, uh, hard drive space, of course, that's not a lot of data. Uh, so while we not talk about big data in uh, our talk, two gigs is not big data, right? Uh, like 200 gigs is not big data. Sometimes you see some people, some blog posts talking about big data in MongoDB with five gigs and well, <laughs> uh, it's not exactly uh, big data. So Stack Overflow, so we imported the data in Postgres um, because we are a bit short on time. We didn't manage to import everything, but uh, we had a table which was around what, 10 gigs, something like that. So we had like half, we didn't have like 18 million questions, but we had like around 8 million questions and we had like, let's say five, 10 gigs out of magnitudes of data uh, in the database. So it's enough not to be trivial to handle on a laptop at least. And so the idea is we have just data in the database, but we want to plot things like what are the trends in the tags over time? And what we do not want to do is using Excel to import the data, right? We want to use pandas, matplotlib to do everything in a notebook because there's the tools you're familiar with. So the whole point of this talk is to show you a bit different tools to be able to handle this kind of problem. Where you have data we have char, not big enough, so you need like distributed computing, all the fancy things that you can see in the other talks. Everything is on one machine, but it's big enough that you cannot do it brute force with pandas on NumPy. And we show a bit how you can use those tools to do this kind of task. So something I should have asked before starting is, how many people know quite a bit about SQL in the room? It's quite a bit. And how many people know quite a bit about pandas, numpy? Okay. So you don't need to. <laughs> this is okay, so hopefully some of you will learn something. Um, so we'll talk a bit about how to uh, deal, to import data from Postgres into Pandas. So Postgres, in case not everybody knows, so Postgres is one of the well-known open source database, like the two big ones are MySQL and uh, Postgres. And Postgres has some interesting features. Um, well, it doesn't corrupt the data for once. And uh, so like it's, it has a few things that allows you to deal with non just relational data, but some other things as well. We learn a bit about how to use SQL Alchemy to deal with databases because sometimes it's actually pretty rare to start from a database. What happens sometimes often is that you have a database already there because that's what another team will use in your company. And we have a database with like hundreds of tables with of course absolutely no documentation and the guy who uh, knew about the schema he left years ago anyway. So the only chance to be able to handle this data is to use something like, for example, SQL Alchemy to kind of load the data for you and to avoid for you to have to look into a database um, directly um, by yourself. We'll talk a bit about how to use Pandas SQL to do kind of the opposite. So you have some Pandas data frame and 
Sometimes it's not easy to remember exactly how to do some complex operation in pandas, or maybe you're just more familiar with SQL. So there is um, it's a cute little tool uh, in, that was created last year by the team from iHat, where you can basically execute some SQL but in a Panda data frame. And we'll talk a bit about how to, handling, how to handle semi-structured data in Postgres. So like, not data which have all exactly the same type, but enough differences that you cannot use normal tables and normal relationship in a SQL world, but like semi-structured data, more like a document world, like, like a lot of people like to use MongoDB, CoachDB, et cetera. But actually you can do quite a bit in pure Postgres uh, through something called HSTOR. So, yeah, with all that, we'll not talk about very large data. So if it's what you're looking for, you can leave right now. We'll not talk about large data. And we'll not talk about all the cool things like scalability, etc. So we'll talk about boring things uh, to, uh, to do the job. Okay, so I've been talking for like, like 10 minutes about database and etc. But Again, especially if you're a scientist, it's not very clear what a database is. If you ask more like a programmer, like someone who has done like Java for 15 years, you ask him what is a database, is, SQL Server, it's DB2, etc. So if you're coming from this world, it's pretty clear. But if you're more like um, a scientist, like a database, you know, it's again these things that you know other people use, but you don't want to touch that. So if you look into Wikipedia, what is a database? A database is an organized collection of data from one or more purposes, usually in digital form. So, okay. So is NumPy array a database? Because it's organized collection of data, right? So maybe not right. Maybe NumPy is a database. Same for pandas. CSV file, is it a database? It's organized collection, well, hopefully organized collection of data. So, Again, if you ask most programmers what is a database, an example is they will talk, you, talk to you about MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, etc. So, I'm trying to expand a bit on this definition from Wikipedia. So, do you say that MySQL, Postgres, are database, and CSV and NumPy are not because there is a querying language? So, in CSV, there is nothing, right? But it's just a file format. NumPy, there is some kind of querying, right? If you want to say, you have an array of integers and you want to ask, give me all the integers that are positive from this array, you can use fancy dexing and this works well. But that's pretty basic querying language. Is it maybe a database because of data modeling? So when you talk about, again, NumPy arrays or CSV files, the modeling is pretty simple in the sense that you have a set of columns maybe, or maybe you just have one type and you have a lot of entries. So, for example, before pandas, what was pretty common in the NumPy world was, let's say you have some data, some climate data, where you have like some temperature across different locations. One thing you could do is to create a structured array, right? So a structured array is this thing where you have a D-type, which is a compound of atomic type. So you have a D-type, which is not just a float or an integer, but that's a D-type, which is 10, 20 floats, because maybe you have 20 locations to look at for your temperature. So you have some kind of basic data modeling here, right? One of the issues is, let's say we don't want just data, but metadata. That's where it's, NumPy starts to be quite limited. Like if you want some metadata on top of this data, like you have 10 or 20 columns, but maybe you want to have some metadata attached to each of these city. So what you could do is to have some separate arrays or some separate dictionary and model your data a bit like that. And that's what a lot of people do. That's only what I used to do um, uh, quite a bit. This works, but it feels a bit dirty, and if it doesn't, we'll explain a bit why later. The last part, which is maybe the most obvious one, is storage. So one reason why people may not be interested in database when they're coming from a scientific background, again, this was my case, is People say database are really fast and everything, and you start like some basic things like, I have 10 million entries and I want to look at the sum, maybe. In NumPy, there's nothing, right? I mean, as long as the NumPy array is in memory, it's like it's, it's, 
you type the command and it's come taking right away. If you try to do that in a database, it's not always obvious um, that it will be fast. Maybe you need some index. Maybe sometimes even with index, it's not that fast. But one of the things that is really critical to database, and that's kind of what convinced me that databases were actually useful even for the scientists, is the idea of storage. Because okay, NumPy arrays, they're really fast. And one of the reasons they are fast is because the data is in one big block, right? So we, the fact that everything is one big block is why NumPy is really fast and why NumPy is not very flexible in the sense that if you want, um, for example, multiple, you have like a file-backed um, file uh, NumPy array, maybe using a memmap arrays. If you have multiple writers to the same data, it doesn't work really well, right? You corrupt your data. So maybe you can take care of like different array, different processes writing to different parts of your NumPy array, and this works fairly well. But what if you need a lot of concurrent accesses? If you start to handle that by yourself, that's pretty painful. Some people were a bit naive, again, myself a few years ago. You know, like you don't realize that when you use like simple files and you try multiple processes to write to the same file, well, the operating system doesn't guarantee anything for you, right? You will corrupt the data, most likely. Or you will corrupt the data. So that's one of the things that databases are really, really good at. And one of the big points of databases is they have a complex storage layer where they can handle a lot of different writers and readers to the same file. Well, I mean, you actually don't see the file anymore, to the same set of files, because at the end of the day, it's on the hard drive, right? But you don't see that directly as a SQL database user. It's really all about abstracting, parallel writing, parallel reading, concurrency is handled for you. So that's kind of a one big point of uh, databases. And obviously, when you have CSV files or NumPy arrays, that doesn't work, right? If you have a CSV file and you want to edit the CSV file and want to store that back to the file system, if you try to handle that correctly by yourself, you will end up implementing a very poor database, right? And databases are exactly about that. What happens often, in reality, is when you use NumPy, CSV file, basic, like, flat file uh, storage, is that you will end up just storing your data back and forth between files. You will copy data and in a certain order, maybe, because you want to access them quickly. And for some, as long as you're the only one working on it, for some cases, it works pretty well. But again, when you need different people or different programs accessing the same data, the chance for corruption is pretty high. That's because of storage and also because of data modeling. That's one thing where databases can be pretty good. Okay. So, to expand a bit on all that. So, you've seen what is a database. So, there is the querying language, there is the data modeling, and there is the storage. So, querying, that's actually not so true anymore. I mean, when I did my presentation a few years ago, it was kind of true in Python world, but it's not really true anymore. And why it's not true is, here we have a simple example where I'm using pandas, panda SQL. Here we have some bit of uh, panda SQL shim that I will not explain here. And here I have some basic data from the Python dev mailing list. So I have basically the topic the sender and the date for each email of the PyDev mailing list in a CSV format. And what I would like to do is, well, maybe I want to see the number of emails per sender using a data frame. So here, sorry, here, PyDev is my data frame, right? One does data frame. I have uh, two columns. From call, well, actually here, we only care about one column. From call, which is the sender of the email. And we have some basic SQL where we select, we have a simple group by, right? We want to get the count of emails per sender. So we write simple SQL here. And with Panda SQL, well, basically with just this command, we get back a data frame that gives us exactly the count per uh, uh, sender. So, 
to answer the first question, is it a database because of the querying language? Well, yes and no, right? Because you can do this kind of things fairly easily in uh, Python and some other languages. Storage. So, as I explained before, when you have an umpire arrays, or pandas arrays, but for that it doesn't really make a difference, when you save it to a data format, most likely if a simple data format like maybe the binary format of NumPy, HDF5, this kind of things, well, HDF5 is a bit more advanced already, but basically it's you have one big file and everything in it. So database works very differently. So database, so that's a very simplified version of database, but basically the, the main idea in database is you store things in things you can call pages, for example. So you have like different pages. And generally this corresponds to the size of one page uh, of your operating system, but not always. So the order of magnitude is a few K kilobyte. And you put the data in there, but it's not contiguous. So that is, when you have the starting point, it will have like some pointer to the next block, and each block knows how to go to the next block. And you have actually some hierarchy in some data structure called B trees, which allows you to find things very quickly. So the find here is the key. Like in databases, you don't have to put everything sequentially, which means that from a pure throughput point of view, it will definitely be slower than NumPy and Pandas. But on the other hand, you want to append like 1% of data to some data in a database, that's fairly easy, because that's just adding one block. If you have an umpire arrays of 100 million entries, you want to add 1 million entries, well, the only real choice is really to create a new numpy arrays and put everything. <coughs> so that's part of the storage idea that databases can do things better here when you need to edit back and forth data and to search for data more efficiently. The other thing that I will not talk much about is databases know a lot about I.O. and how to do I.O. efficiently. NumPy definitely doesn't. Pandas, I'm not sure. Pandas is a bit smarter for like reading like text files and things like that, but NumPy is really dumb for all the basic I.O. function in, in NumPy. <laughs> and because most of the I.O. is based on single files, reading and writing, concurrent reading and writing, that doesn't work at all with NumPy or Pandas. Dealing with random I.O., that doesn't really work well either. Databases are much better at handling this kind of thing. So if you need like large data which are larger than your RAM, or if you need data where you know you need to modify them quite often, databases is often a more appropriate storage story at least than pure NumPy. The last part is the data modeling. So that's another idea that I didn't really know about uh, as a pure scientist is, again, taking this example of uh, climate data. So you have maybe 10 or 20 measurements for 20 different cities, and maybe you have, I don't know, like 100K uh, measurements. We need some metadata for the cities. So one thing you could do, of course, is to have some dictionaries with those metadata, or maybe some objects with the metadata for cities and you link them back and forth with NumPy arrays. And that's fairly easy to do in Python. So the problem is what starts to happen when you need to store that and give that to someone else, right? It's in different files. So it's very likely that if you start dealing with other peoples, and other people include yourself three months later, right? You may have some issue because of data corruption, because you forget that those things are linked. When you start having different data which are linked together in different files, Experience right, tells us that often you will start to have like inconsistency and corruption. One of the key points in data modeling, right, in SQL, is to have the data normalized. That is, you try to invent some like formal definition, but we don't have really the time to go into the formal definition. But the basic idea of normalized data is pretty intuitive: is you want to remove the redundancy of the data, and the whole point of doing that is first to save some space on the hard drive, but maybe more importantly, to be robust against deletion and changes in your uh, data. Because again, like in this simple example here, where we have like different, would be like different NumPy arrays, right? 
and they have some relation. So in our example of um, climate data, we would have like some ID maybe for each cities, and we would have our object cities with the metadata of each city, and you have that kind of a relation between them. But if later you want to ask an umpire way where you want, give me the 100K data, and for each data, give me the metadata of the cities because it's easier to handle. In NumPy, your only way is really to copy everything. Databases, reviews, et cetera, can do things a bit better here. Okay, so that was a bit of a long introduction to try to, to convey the idea that there is like a world that is outside NumPy and Pandas where you can use databases to do uh, different things. Those things include data larger than memory, things where you need to be smart about the file I.O. storage, the storage layer story, where you need concurrence access both in reading and more importantly in writing, and when you need to be able to edit your data back and forth because NumPy and Pandas are not really great tool to deal with that issue. So a bit more concretely now is to look at some tools to, to do these kind of things because okay, Maybe you're convinced that you should use some databases because you have some data that require databases. But how do you do that in Python? How do you do that with NumPy, with Pandas? So one of the first tools that is not mandatory but is almost always the right tool to use for databases in Python is to use SQL Alchemy. So, uh, So since pretty much everyone is familiar with databases, I will skip quite a few examples. And how many of you know, know SQL Alchemy? Okay, so I will be very quick. Um, so, so SQL Alchemy is, um, so one definition is, um, it's a pretty good one, is it's a database toolkit. So it's not just an object relational mapper, but it's actually not the most interesting part of SQL Alchemy. Really, the one interesting um, thing with SQL Alchemy is the, the layer to design. That is, you don't just have object relational mapper. Because sometimes using object relational mapper gives you, give you a lot of abstraction, but sometimes you have some issue in terms of performances. So the maybe strongest selling point of SQL Alchemy is that you can go one layer down to use something that SQL Alchemy calls a co-expression language, right? Where you don't use objects or classes, but you, class, and you don't model your tables by uh, classes, but you deal directly with table, tables. So here, just for the people not so familiar with uh, SQL Alchemy, the point is not to talk about the SQL Alchemy API, but we need to talk about how you would use um, SQL Alchemy um, for some databases. So here, for simplicity, we use SQLite because that's already available in Python out of the box. We connect to, uh, this is a syntax to say we want an in-memory database. We create our in-memory database. And we create a set of uh, tables, where here only one table, where we call cities. And that's a very simple data where we have some city with some cities in the US with a corresponding state and a population, um, how many people you have in this city. So we create a hole here, we just ensure that the table is created. And with SQL Alchemy, you can start to connect to the database and to insert some data. So we say, so again, the data is not really interesting here, but we, we insert uh, the population of Los Angeles in the state of California. Um, and so what SQL Alchemy gives us here is some abstraction because we don't care about SQLite except for the first line. All of this would work <laughs> in most SQL databases supported by SQL Alchemy. So the other thing that is nice is you can pass dictionary here. You cannot do that with pure DB API 2 in Python. And here we just insert some data. And then you can do some basic uh, SQL operation. So for example, if you want just the name of every city, we can have this basic um, SQL, uh, SQL Alchemy operation where each SQL operation is 
abstracted in Python. So you never write SQL as text, right? You really have like Python function, the actual object. You can deal with them programmatically, so it's much better than just using raw SQL. The other thing I want to look at a bit was, okay, so we should use this. Okay. is the object relational mapper level. So this is the highest level available in um, SQL alchemy. When you deal with large data for like kind of data analysis, sometimes there's too much to do that, but sometimes it can be useful. Like Simon later will show some examples where you use the ORM directly to uh, import some data. So the basic idea is fairly simple. So you have some tables, the same table as before, where you have the table city, where you have some um, well, name for the city, uh, the population, and the name of the state. So the way to model that is fairly simple in SQL Alchemy. You first have a class factory, a declarative base. So often convention is to call that class base. And then you subclass each new class that represents an object you want to model, you want to map to SQL, will be a, a subclass of base. Table name here is to specify the name of the table, because maybe you have some existing databases that you want to put the object relational mapper on top of. And here we have the different uh, columns. So here ID name, and here ID name, state ID, and population. When you use object relational mapper, again, we won't go into the details, but just so people who are not familiar with SQL Alchemy can still follow the examples later from Simon, you create sessions. And session is how you can write, you create some object, and you write them to the database through session object. And when you want to fetch some data from the database and create the object, based on reception as well. And so here, that's an example on how to do uh, things for, again, some simple data in CSV format. You want to import in the database. We read the data with the CSV, the standard library of Python. And we just create, passing the data, we create some objects as we would create normal Python object. And we add them to the session. We do the same for cities. And once we are done, we have only a few rows each. So we just do everything and we commit at the end. So once we commit, once the commit is successful, then the data is written in the database. Once you have data in the database, you can start querying them. So the way to query them in uh, from SQL Alchemy is again through the session object. Session query and you want to query object from the class city. And here we just want all the cities. So we get back cities instance, right? So good things here, right? And then since we have simple objects, you know, we know how to do that with Python because we know Python, and we can just look at the name attribute, the state ID, population, etc. <clears throat> of course, in general, you don't want to load everything. Um, you want to load things according to some criterion, and then you will use a filter function. And the way SQL Alchemy is designed is pretty neat. It allows you to like kind of pipe, in a sense, like filters, just using function composition. And we filter, so here I will talk about that later, but maybe we want just all the cities that are from Texas. And here I get just the cities from Texas. There is a mistake here, someone mentioned before, I need to fix Arlington, I think he's not in Texas. Yeah, maybe there are several, but yeah. Uh, I'm not very knowledgeable about American geography. Okay, so that's the basic idea of the object relational mapper in SQL Alchemy. You have your classes, often but not always one class per table. <coughs> and here, so I have my state and my cities. 
And that's the first example of this normalization idea I mentioned before. Since most of you are familiar with SQL, you know about normalization. But just as a small reminder, so we have the name of the state. And what you would do, for example, if you are in NumPy, let's say you have a NumPy array where you have one row per city, and you have a colon which is a name, and a colon which is a population. You structure that way to do that. And you have a colon with the state name. So problem is you have to repeat the state name all the time, right? If you have 10 cities from Texas, you have to repeat Texas 10 times. So problem is what if somewhere later you want to change text to Texas? Well, you need to do that everywhere. If you're not careful, or more exactly when you're not careful, you will most likely get some corruption because, or invalid data, more exactly, because you have this redundancy here. So the reason we have a separate cities uh, uh, state class here, sorry, is because in cities, if you were careful, you didn't have the state name but the state ID. The state ID refers to the other table state, so that we have a table state where you have only like the state, so 50 states in the US. And if you want to change text to Texas, we only have to change exactly one row because all the cities that mention Texas, they will not mention it through the name, but through some ID here. This is the kind of thing you cannot do in NumPy or Pandas, really, because of the way, like, you always have one, a bit like one big table to use a SQL uh, vocabulary. You have, like, denormalized data. Denormalized data is not bad. It can be nice for speed reasons, for like easy handling reason, but you have this trade-off that it makes it harder to have always consistent data. Okay. So, if you're rich from your SQL alchemy, there is not much new here. But for the people who weren't, like the idea was just to give you a bit enough about SQL alchemy so you can follow the more interesting example that Simon will talk about. So the idea is you have two layers, core to abstract the SQL, and then you have the above layer where you map objects to tables. I know Simon will talk about how to use SQL alchemy and a bit of pandas to actually do some, not just talk about cities, but about stack overflow some interesting data from Stack Overflow. So David mentioned at the start the uh, Stack Overflow tags uh, on the posts and the trend and popularity of uh, various tags, uh, which is the uh, basic example that I'm going to go for. But first, um, just the importing of uh, Stack Overflow data from these XML files. They, they ship a handful of XML files for each uh, Stack Exchange site. Uh, I chose something that wasn't too big because running on a little laptop here, I don't have uh, a terabyte of RAM to play with. Um, I chose the second largest, which is the uh, <coughs> meth.stackexchange.com, um, which That's the data they give you. So there's two gigabytes of data for uh, the distant second uh, site of Stack Overflow, which is, uh, if I remember correctly, about 600,000 um, posts, which pales to the 18 million of Stack Overflow. Um, if we look at the data, We just got this pretty nasty looking XML document. Um, it's very straightforward, one row per uh, post. Um, easy enough to parse into either a data frame or a database, but assuming we're working with a large amount of data, uh, we go into a database. Is 
Mal Okay, I don't know why I'm there. Let's kill my startup file. Okay, I don't know where my Emacs has gone. We'll uh, use something slightly less, less exciting. Uh, and of course, that's what's gone wrong. Sorry about that. So, um, we've got, I've only loaded a small portion of the data, uh, just a very simple relation, which is the relationship between the posts and all of the tags. So there's a many-to-many -many relationship. We've got uh, each post can have multiple tags, and obviously the same tag can be applied to multiple posts. So instead of denormalizing that like you would in a NumPy array or a data frame, I've split those out into two separate, separate tables and uh, built a simple relationship. What I like about this is that the database schema looks pretty simple. Uh, I'm not a big fan of SQL myself. I like this sort of definition. Um, and that's just everything that you can find in uh, the posts is what you might expect which forum it's from, so math.stackexchange or Stack Overflow, um, the creation date, the actual content of the, uh, the question is the body, and that's about all we're going to care about uh, for this. Um, so that's actually a pretty small definition there, a small schema. Um, the importing code is slightly more involved, although the only, most of it is the sort of mapping from what's in the XML to what's going in the database, the column name, and the data type, which we have a separate mapping down here. The actual code for loading is simply, we pass an XML file, and we expect it to be large, so we iteratively pass it row by row, and we do an import row by row, which we use our two mappings to the uh, correct column name and the data type and session.add, like David uh, introduced you to. And just in the case of something going wrong, I commit every thousand rows, which turned out to be a good idea when importing Stack Exchange um, or Stack Overflow. It stopped at about eight million rows for reasons unknown. Um, so the actual import code with SQL Alchemy, I think, is very simple. Uh, that was a matter of minutes um, putting that together, which gives us a database of oops, uh, So that gives us our tags. So now we're just into um, pandas. We've got our tags and just use pandas to analyze that, find the most popular tags. We've got uh, what you might expect in the mathematics forum, some number theory, some integration, probability and homework turns out to be the most popular uh, topic. So, well, when that came out, I had to play with that a little bit. Um, it's probably the most simple thing you can do, just um, group by the date and uh, see how many posts on each day we've got from uh, people asking for somebody to do their math homework for them. And I quite like that graph. It's a bit noisy, but um, you can see some definite periodic uh, cyclic trends. Probably when people leave school and uh, end of term, they don't have any math homework for other people to do. Uh, but 
clean up the noise. Okay, it would actually be more trivial to do it in pandas, but um, assuming we've got a very large uh, data set again, we go back to SQL and just change how we select the date. So we truncate at the month, so we get monthly data and do exactly the same thing again, and we land up with a more easy to see uh, period. So tails off until September, and then everybody goes back to school, and they've got more homework again. So you can see quite clearly the, the cycles there. Now that was actually a really simple example because I did the same thing, just loading the XML into um, pandas directly. The post XML, uh, like we saw here, that's um, 600 megabytes. I think anybody can do that now. Um, slightly more tricky one, we've got eight million rows here. It's still probably get it in my memory on this laptop, but it starts to push the balance a bit. So we've got eight million rows. Um, this is the full stack exchange, what you might expect, various libraries, languages. Apparently C Sharp is either popular or people have a lot of problems with it. <laughs> um, and oh, I've not updated that properly. So pick multi-threading and just the same again. Uh, it's become a more popular topic, I guess, with multi-core uh, trends and things. That's just exactly the same thing again. So, um, David, do you want to? Go on with your edge store. Yep. Okay, so. <clears throat> so, if you summarize a bit what we've seen, like, looked a bit how to use, like, things like Panda SQL to use SQL from data frames. Made a very brief introduction to SQL Alchemy, so you could follow um, easily for people not familiar with SQL Alchemy, you could follow um, the example from Simon. It's pretty unfortunate we couldn't see the example, like, in real time with the database we have in Cambridge. but. Like the Stack Overflow example where we have eight to 10, like eight, the order of magnitude of several millions rows. It's not something you can handle very well um, in NumPy and Pandas because, well, if you just have a few integer values per rows, 20 million rows, that's not much, right? But yeah, if you have like textual data like you have in Stack Overflow, if you want to start looking at not just the tags, but like the information inside the post. Because the database not only has the tags and everything, but also like the, the content of the questions, the content of the answers. You could do like some full text search kind of things, where you could search not just according to tag, but to like the content of the post. And again, because the idea is you don't want to use SQL to do things like plotting and everything, it's so much easier to do in pandas. So you have your data in the database you can use full text search capability of Postgres and then get back a subset of the data that you care about. As long as the subset itself is small enough, you can um, use uh, NumPy, Pandas, data from this term. So, okay. The problem is what happens if you have data which are a bit less clean? Because Stack Overflow, it's not super large, but it's not a trivial either a data set. But because the data were exported, well, I don't know the structure of architecture of Stack Overflow, but most likely they're using SQL Server as well. They just exported to XML. That's well modeled data set with tables and everything. But real data set that is coming from the outside world, that's not as clean as that, right? So one of the problems we have is this semi-structured data. So what do I mean by semi-structured data? Well, you have things like JSON, right? You have like some JSON document uh, coming, maybe, maybe if it's, you have some logs information stored in, um, in JSON format. And each entry is you expect a set of keys, 
but not always the same kind of keys. Or maybe you don't even know exactly, um, like, with this, like, you know there's always one or two or three keys, but there are a lot of keys you just have no idea. Or maybe you just know all the keys, but maybe the value is not always the same. You cannot model that very well in a normal SQL database because either you need to know the, all the keys, because you can have some known entries using null, et cetera, but if the set of keys you're expecting is in the order of magnitude of 1,000, to start creating SQL database with thousands of columns, that's not exactly how you're supposed to do it. There is also the issue that sometimes the type of the value is different. So for these kind of things, there is HStore I'm in Postgres. So HStore is actually a very, well, very old. It's, it's a decade old, I think, extension in Postgres, but that started to make a bit more noise recently because I did some features to it that make it very useful. So what is HStore? I will go back to that slide later. So HStore is not out of the box in Postgres. I guess it may depend a bit on your operating system, but at least on Debian or Ubuntu install, if you want to install, uh, if you want to be able to use HStore, we, uh, uh, so we'll make the slides available publicly so you don't need to take pictures if you and you can, of course, but uh, we have everything uh, available. So um, you need to install Contrib for this version of Postgres to have HStore. So Postgres 9.3 is the latest release version of Postgres. For HStore, you want to use a recent version of Postgres. It makes a big difference because of the new features they add to the HStore uh, extension. So. To uh, be able to use extra from uh, Postgres, it's fairly simple. Once you're in a database, you just say create extension HStore. And assuming you have a store uh, extension installed, if you do that, you have a store, uh, we can start to use HStore. Okay, so what is HStore? So the idea of HStore is that it gives you a key value store in Postgres. So it gives you all the advantages and all the disadvantages, disadvantages sorry, of a key value store. So when I say key value store, it means you have a single colon, so that's a new type, like int or string or varchar, et cetera. There's a single type, so you can have some integer colon, some string colon, and you have an additional colon, which is a store type. The value you put inside this H store colon is basically a Python dictionary. It's not a Python dictionary, but it's like, from a structural point of view, it's the same as a Python dictionary. So here, the kind of data I wanted to look at is the email from the Python mailing list. So you can download the archive in the mbox format. Mbox format is just a simple text file. So we have, you have like one mbox per uh, month. So you have one text file per month. And this just appended each email with the metadata, right? Like from sender, the subject, etc. I don't know much about email uh, format and protocols, but anyway, when you get the inbox from uh, PyDev and PyList, each email doesn't have the same set of keys. So I said, okay, that may be a decent example of looking at HStore. So let's say I importing those data, I pass inbox, very easy in Python. I have one dictionary per email and I store this dictionary as a single value inside um, uh, my HStore table, and my table with HStore column. So my table here is very simple, it's two colon, one ID, which is a primary key integer, and the other one is called data, which is my HStore value. So now what I can do when I have some data is I can create this data pack. I can, select, I can say, I want to know how many emails there is by this guy here at Python. Um, how many emails did he write on Python dev? So I can simply do a count of my values from PyList my table and with a where condition. Syntax is almost exactly as if from where a colon, but from here is not a colon. 
That's one of the key inside the value inside HStore. In particular, I may have some entries without a from entry. But here, HStore, there's a point, it can handle this very easily. So it's exactly like a document in a document database, right? Like the basic feature you have in CocheDB and in uh, MongoDB and other document stores, it's the same, right? Like when you use a MongoDB uh, API from Python, what you insert is documents. So you can do the same kind of things. You have the same kind of disadvantages, right? Because now the database doesn't know anything about from, right? So if you have two million rows with a from key and the value, you need to store that many rows from. The advantage, of course, is it, well, I don't know if it's an advantage, but you don't have to think much about your uh, data modeling. And so here I do some count. Uh, I forgot exactly how many data I have, but it's Python or Python list. So it's not big, but it's not completely trivial. It's, I think, maybe the order of my total of one million rows. <coughs> So it's a Python list, the archive of, for some reason, uh, don't have, they don't make the data before 99 available. But all the emails on the Python, the main Python mailing list, right? So the big traffic mailing list for Python. I have all the emails from 99 to more or less, well, not today, but to, to January 2014. So if I want to count how many uh, emails were written by uh, this label, I can see, okay, I can count them, and it takes 200 milliseconds. For a long time, that's what you could do with HStore. And you can think, okay, HStore is useful because you can put some kind of dictionary-like value, but you may think, well, maybe I could just have used some cell as, maybe I could just use string or varchar and put like a cell as JSON inside it and I cell as back and forth JSON. You could certainly do that, and a lot of people do that. They don't use JSON, but I've seen many cases where people use pickle, right? They want to store objects in Python, they will store the pickle string in the database and load it back. Don't do that. But many people do it. Um, here, where it becomes interesting is, so I don't know when exactly, I don't know if it's from nine or nine one, we can create indices on the keys inside your column. And then it becomes interesting. So here I can say, I'm creating an index on my table. There are like different type of indices, right? Here I'm deciding to create a B3 type of index for the key from. So what does this mean is that, of course it will take a while, well, not much because it's a small table here, but it will go into every row and it will uh, see the data uh, inside my H store colon, my data colon and we will be able to do a mapping. It's more than a mapping, but more speaking, a mapping, so that it can easily get back the key, the value at the key from. And sure enough, if you do the same kind of operation as before, which is exactly the same one, you gain a two order of magnitude. It takes only like a few milliseconds. So actually timing doesn't really matter. To be honest, I didn't do any serious benchmarking here. The scripts will be available, so you can try on your machine. What I'm more interested in is to see that there is an index and you can actually see that the index is uh, useful. One of the things with the H store uh, is that it's stored as binary. So I don't know the details of the uh, data, but it's stored in a way that is efficient. In terms of space and in terms of um, Speed of access. Okay. So it will be quick. Uh, okay, this will be hard. Uh, uh, sorry? Excuse me, I'm just coming up. The other terminal? Oh, you mean this one? The other tab? Or? Oh, yeah, sorry. And no. Uh, this one? Yeah, great. Okay, so I don't know that keyboard. Okay, so I have my database emails. 
where I have two tables, PyDev and uh, PyList. <coughs> Sequences, well, for people who are maybe more familiar with MySQL, in Postgres, in Oracle as well, you don't have the notion of auto-increment directly. Instead, you create sequences which are separate objects. But basically, you can ignore these two. Like, we have two lists, two tables, PyList and PyDev. So, select uh, from, uh, so, okay, from PyDev. So, here we can see I have, like, so it's PyDev. So the example I showed before is for PyList. It's for PyDev, which is why I have fewer, um, fewer entries. So if we look at uh, PyDev, so here, so slash D is just to show the schema, right, in my table. And as I mentioned before, it's a very simple schema where you have one type integer and one type H store. So there's no colon from, no colon right. So, select, um, well, let's say from uh, PyDev, where ID equal one. So just to show one entry. We have the ID, one, of course, and we have the whole value, right? Again, like a dictionary, with a date from message ID subject. But until now, it's not obvious why that's actually very useful compared to just serializing back into one column. So what starts to be interesting is you can do things like that. Data. Now I'm selecting all, or well not all, sorry, I'm selecting the, um, the value for the key from inside my store. So you can query inside the colon H store. You can create indices as well. So. We have actually a lot of operators available, and I still don't know them all, but uh, no, I forgot, is it? No. Yeah. I actually forgot the exact syntax. Um, I mean, I'm supposed to have my aid in front of me, but I don't. Uh, let's see if I can do that easily. Um, oops. I apologize for that. I forgot the exact syntax of that operator. So we. Oh, it's just question mark. Okay. So what the question mark does is, so indeed, just to check which are the entries where you have the key from. You can even do like partial, like partial match, where you don't just match for the exact string from, but maybe you want to look for all the entries where there is a key that is like something. And depending on which kind of indices you create on top of that, you can get different values. You don't. In, in time, uh, in checking time, maybe, that, uh, when you are inserting the, the different records? So, 
what do you mean exact what do you mean exactly by how, how making it known You mean when you enter? You mean when you enter the value, or? I mean that there is a there is a field which is called from. No, right? I mean. Or you mean that the, the, the text is indexed? So Postgres doesn't. Fully, is fully indexed the text. And, uh, so maybe if I show uh, my next. Uh, sorry, here we go. Like that's how I imported the data, so maybe it will make more sense. So that's why Python comes in. So SQL Alchemy knows about HStore. So since it's, of course, not standard SQL, it's specific to Postgres, you need to import the Postgres dialect. You import HStore, and here I'm creating so a table for PyDev and a table for PyList. Here I say I have a store colon and with a default dictionary. And so here I have like my one M box per uh, month. Just do whatever I need to do. It's very stupid script, but um, I just do the import of the M box. And here I iterate over each email of the M box. Here I have a simple dict comprehension to convert that to a simple dictionary. So here I have a dictionary with the key from and the value, key subject and the value, etc. And I enter that directly. You pass the dictionary. Yeah, yeah I pass the dictionary that, that, here. That, that was the question. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so um, in a recent version of Postgres, oh wait, is it in 9.3 or is it in dev? I'm not sure, no anymore, but um, you can actually have like a, I mean, you can have more than one level in the dictionary. You can have dictionary, dictionary, with support again for indices and things like that. But I forgot if it's in the dev or if it's already available in the last uh, nine three. <coughs> and so that's the part to import the data. So here, really straight up Python. Nothing interesting going on. And uh, okay, it's so I'm afraid I won't be able to execute the script. So we will have to take my words for it. Uh, but that's all you need to import back the data after in a pandas data frame. Here yeah, I just create a psycho PG2 uh, connection. And now I want to say, give me all the emails, but which, or more exactly not the emails, but those three values inside the colon H store, where I have the, where I have, sorry, the key from, the key date, and the key subject. So, yeah. I'm a bit afraid of executing uh, the things here because of the small technical issues. But the basic idea is when you can, it, you can um, create that into a pandas data frame, you can do that, of course, for PyDev and for PyList. And then you can look easily at things like what is the um, thread with the most messages. As it happened, it's uh, Py, uh, Python versus uh, Lisp is uh, the thread with the most uh, uh, number of posts since uh, the beginning of the archive. And if you look at the person who has written the most emails um, on the PyDev mailing list, you see that it's Guido, et cetera. And all these kind of things are very easy to do once you have these kind of things here. So for PyDev and PyList, it's a bit like the example that Simon showed with um, the math uh, stack exchange. It's small enough that you actually don't even really care, need to care about database. You could just do everything in pandas. Initially, we wanted to do analysis with uh, Linux scaling mailing list, but uh, we didn't manage to get the archive. Um, but it would have been interesting to do some basic text search to see the trends, uh, maybe in swearing in the Linux scaling mailing list or things like that. 
And the next kernel, the kernel mailing list is big enough that you cannot just have one big uh, Pandas data frame because the data is too large, and especially if you want to have the text with it together, I mean, at least on a, with this laptop, a 16 gigs of RAM. So, but like on maybe a slightly less powerful machine, it may be a bit too difficult. And if you have more data anyway, then you cannot really do that anymore. And H store is um, it's a very interest. I, I find it a very interesting feature because, um, in terms of efficiency, it's it's not exactly the same, but it's quite on. It's at least not ridiculous compared to f document databases like MongoDB and um, CoachDB in terms of performances. And you get all the other advantages. You get transaction support. You get SQL Alchemy support. You get all those things that MongoDB and CoachDB don't, right? And you can use the same store for both. Um, so for example, for one of the projects internally, at insert, I'm using a store um, for uh, some of um, so for some internal product we're working on. And it gives some interesting, um, it's an interesting feature because it allows you to keep the schema feature for the tables you really know about and the less, there's more schema-less feature in, um, in uh, the S store. And you can migrate from one to the other as you evolve as well if you want. Okay, so we don't have time, but that's good because we are at the end of the talk. Uh, so, so hopefully um, it was maybe not a very structured talk, but hopefully gave you an idea of the kind of things you can do using both databases and NumPy pandas. For example, the example that Simon showed where you have the data in the database, but like when you want to plot things easily, that's fairly easy to do in pandas, right? So you can do that fairly easily with all the features of SQL import from pandas and uh, database uh, feature of either SQL Alchemy or even straight up Python SQL Alchemy. When you have more like less structured data like document databases, well, you can still use Postgres as well with the HStore um, um, facility. And one thing is that the HStore is, keep, is, coming, is um, taking more and more features. In the next Postgres version, they are thinking about adding types information to the HStore. So you can say, this, this value, if the key exists, that's an integer, that's a bool, that's a string. So like you get more, like toward more feature, like again, like a document database uh, kind of uh, story. So it's a pretty interesting thing if you didn't know about it. Anyway, thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, do you have time for questions? No, so no questions. Uh, we, well, of course, you can ask us questions offline. And um, the talk is not online just yet, but we'll put it online tonight, just clean up a few things. It will be on GitHub, the scripts. I will try to put the data, uh, well, not, not the Stack Overflow data, uh, that's on BitTorrent, but all the other data, CSV file, et cetera, on S3, so you can play with the data and um, play by yourself. Okay, thank you. <laughs>